Okay, I think we ran out of water. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 2. We've, uh, we've actually been in the book of Acts, but this summer we're taking a break. We wanted to split up the book of Acts because it's rather long. And the first several chapters of Acts uh, deal with really the Apostle Peter. So we took a break after the first section of Acts to actually study 2 Peter. 2 Peter is an often unread book of the Bible. I wonder how many of us have actually read and studied 2 Peter. So I thought it would be a great place for us to take a break from Acts during the summer. We'll get back to Acts, by the way, the Sunday after Labor Day. In 2 Peter 2, at the end, Peter gives the church a heads up. Just like he did in 1 Peter 5, where he said, Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, but resist him. Well, we're to be on the alert, and Peter's going to say that again to us this morning. Now, I want to let you know that the past several weeks, I have particularly been on alert, seriously on alert, but not because of spiritual warfare. Unfortunately, not because of the devil. I should be more alert. It's because of my staff team. <laughs> Hear me out here. Hey, we got a great staff team. I love our staff team, the entire staff, ministerial, administrative, uh, all of the other servants and helpers we have. We get along great, we're on the same page, but we decided to do this team building exercise. It's called Assassin. We drew names and we received clothespins that has your mark on it, your target. Well, let me tell you, I'm freaking out, all right? I mean, I am so on guard, I can't go through a doorway without checking out everything. I feel like Jason Bourne. I can't go into a restaurant without getting my back next to the wall so that I can figure out who's coming in and who might have me. My head's on a swivel. Everybody's a possible enemy. Man, I wish I was that much on guard against sin. against evil. The, the term on guard is a French term from days way long by when there were sword fights. And before someone would come at you with a sword, they would say, on guard, which means get ready, I'm coming at you. Satan knows no chivalry. He will never give you a heads up. He will never say on guard. And he's not playing a game. Our heads and hearts really better be on a swivel. And he never alerts us of his attack. The serpent of old is a copperhead, not a rattlesnake. He will never reveal his presence to you until after he's struck. Thankfully, however, we have a good, good father who's a good, good shepherd. And when we need to be heads up, he's the one who shouts, on guard! And he does that through giving us warnings. We're going to look at a Pray for me. We're going to look at a tough passage today. And I want you to know that if I come across intense, it's not because I haven't eaten. Okay? It's, it's because this passage is intense. And we need to be reminded that the warnings of God are just as kind and just as gracious as the promises of God. The warnings of God are just as kind and just as gracious as the promises of God. The promises of God invite us to our highest delight, and the warnings of God alert us to our worst nightmare. And sometimes warnings are intense, 
If, if one of you whom I love is, is in front of an onrushing truck, I'm going to tackle you. And guess what? I may break a few ribs. Not because I'm trying to break your ribs, but because I'm tackling you to get you out of a way out of an oncoming truck. Sometimes the warnings of God will feel like you're getting a broken rib. It's not that he's unkind or harsh. It's actually because he loves you that you feel like you get kicked in the ribs. Yeah, the passage before us, surprisingly, is actually not harsh, not unkind. It's actually very pastoral. The good shepherd is watching out for our souls. And he's going to warn us about false teachers and false teaching. False teaching, false understandings of the gospel that can creep into our lives too. It's not just out there with false teachers. It's in our lives as well if we're not careful. So let's all stand out of reverence for the Word of God and follow along as I read 2 Peter 2, second part of verse 10 through the end of the chapter. This is God's Word. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For, speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved." For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them to never have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. This is God's word. All of it. And he gave it to us and he gave this passage to us because he's the good shepherd. And he wants to warn us to stay away from error. Let's pray. Father, People may be thinking, how in the world is this going to apply to my life? Well, God, show us and apply it by your Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat. We have a saying around here at Oak Mountain. It didn't originate with us, but we repeat it. The reality is evil is hunting you. Everybody here, evil is is hunting you. Not only is the serpent like a copperhead, he's an aggressive copperhead. And he's coming after you to strike you. And the only way to be prepared is to be on the alert, to be on guard. Three particular attacks of evil that we need to be on guard against. First of all, 
Be on guard against every form of pride. The, the, the first sin we need to guard against is pride. That's what Eve's temptation was. She wanted to become like God, and, and the serpent tempted her to do that. Look at verse 10 of our text. Bold and willful. Now, bold is often a good thing, isn't it? Uh, if someone is a, a strong witness, they're bold for Christ. This isn't positive here. This, this word bold means reckless, foolhardy pride. It means rashness. It means brashness. And willful means rather than surrendering to God's will, rather than submitting to God's will, you choose to assert your own. So bold and willful means arrogantly thinking more of yourself than God calls you to think. In other words, arrogantly thinking that you can face things that God's not called you to face and you're not equipped to face. Let me give you a couple examples. If you hang out in bars and you're an alcoholic, that's reckless pride. That's foolishness. You have no business as an alcoholic, even as a repentant alcoholic, to put yourself in harm's way by hanging out in bars. That'd be reckless pride. That'd be foolishness. Uh, another example. And I'll even give the benefit of the doubt on this one to, uh, as far as an illustration. Let's say you're engaged. So this goes way beyond engagement. But let's say you're engaged. And you spend the night alone in the same place but in separate beds. That's just reckless. It's foolish. You're not supposed to put yourself in that kind of situation. Well, these false teachers in their arrogant pride, in their recklessness, would play games with the devil, play games with evil. And by the way, we do that too, especially young people. Ouija boards. Okay, I'm, listen, you guys know me. I'm not a flaming fundy, but, but you don't be playing with Ouija boards. Okay, you're messing with things that have realness behind it. Okay, there, there are all kinds of fortune tellers. You, you, we're going to talk about that in a moment. You don't go to fortune tellers. Even messing around with horoscopes. Okay, this stuff is real. It's not play. Satan isn't playing assassin. He is the assassin of our souls. And if we recklessly and arrogantly think we can step on certain pieces of turf without being attacked, then our pride has blinded us. Now, in this particular instance, these false teachers are playing games with the devil by calling him to task and saying, I judge you, devil. And unfortunately, I've heard some Christians do that. You know, I take authority in the name of Jesus and I rebuke you, devil. No, I don't think we're supposed to do that. Matter of fact, there were people in the book of Acts that did that. Now, the apostles did it, and I think they were specifically commanded to do that by Jesus. But there were these uh, seven sons. We had six children today, so Brad, you got to get busy. Uh, you know, we got to adopt one or something. But there were seven sons of Sceva, and they saw the apostles casting out demons. They thought, that looks really cool. I think we're going to do that. And so they actually invoked the name of Jesus over the demons and said, come out. Well, the problem was they were using the name of Jesus, but they didn't know Jesus. The seven sons of Sceva were not taking the Christian life seriously. And in their reckless pride, they just thought they'd play with evil. You know what happened in Acts 19? The demons came out of a man and attacked the seven sons of Sceva, stripped them of their clothes, so the seven sons ran out of town naked and bleeding. That's what happens when we engage in reckless pride. That's what happens when we concern ourselves with matters that God has not called us to concern ourselves with. So what do we do with evil? 
Well, look at the contrast between these false teachers who were, who were judging demons versus the angels themselves. Look at verse 11. Angels, though greater in might, in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment. Now, to understand 2 Peter, you need to read Jude. If, if you want to read 2 Peter and understand the details behind what Peter's talking about, go to Jude. In Jude, Jude actually gives the example of the archangel Michael, who was in an argument with the devil. And even the archangel Michael, the mightiest of the angels, did not say, I rebuke you, devil. But instead, Michael said, looking to the Lord, the Lord rebuke you. In other words, he was humble. He wasn't arrogant. He was humble. And that attitude of humility is our safeguard against reckless pride. Now, you may be thinking, well, so what, Bob? I'm not rebuking demons. What does this possibly have to do with my life? Well, listen, blasphemous judgment that's used three times in 10, 11, and 12. Blasphemy, blasphemy, blasphemy. Blasphemy actually has to do with minimizing God. It has to do with, with usurping God's place. It's, it's words or actions that diminish God. That's what blasphemy is. And these false teachers were usurping the place of God in judging the demons. You think, well, okay, Bob, I'm still not getting it. Okay, well, let me put it this way. Do you ever judge other people? Do you ever think that other people are worse sinners than you are? You've just judged them. And you've usurped the place of God. And you're guilty of reckless pride. Do you ever judge Scripture? Can I answer that? Yeah. We all do. Think about it. Every time you sin, you are stepping over Scripture and judging it. And you're choosing to do your own independent will rather than following God's will. So we all judge Scripture, which means we're diminishing God, which means we're actually engaging the same blasphemous sin as the false teachers. Do you ever judge the church? Meaning, about, did you ever minimize the role of the church in your life? Do you ever diminish the presence of Christ in the congregation? Do you ever take lightly the privilege of gathering as the body of Christ? That's diminishing God. It's engaging in the blasphemous sin of the false teachers. See how desperately we all need Jesus? You see how relevant 2 Peter is even when it talks about a bunch of false teachers that are rebuking demons? Look at verse 12. It says, these teachers are like irrational animals, creatures of instinct. That's what pride does. Pride blinds us from God's will, God's way, God's word, God's guidance, God's spirit. Pride blinds us and causes us to trust our gut. Trust our instinct. Trust our intellect. This is intellectual and spiritual pride. Look, there are so many things in this world that God just hasn't told us about. And the only thing we can do is embrace and adopt an attitude of humility. We can't speak where God hasn't spoken. We have to be careful about following our gut. As a matter of fact, Oftentimes, I would say you need to live with a healthy mistrust of yourself. And that's also why we need community. So that we can help each other when it comes to being creatures of instinct. Can you reason with a great white shark? If, if you're in the middle of the sea and a great white shark comes after you, can you say, hey, whoa, time out. Can we talk about this? Right? You can't reason with a great white shark. It lives by instinct. It is a meat eater. 
It is devoid of any moral compass. It is unable to be guided. Peter says that's what happens when we give in to pride, recklessness. And then look what it says, verse 12, born to be cut and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. By the way, ignorant here doesn't mean they don't have any knowledge. Ignorant means they refuse to submit to the knowledge God's given them. Think about that in light of our culture. The world knows where Christians stand on various issues. It's not a matter of ignorance, meaning lack of knowledge. It's a matter of they stubbornly refuse to believe that what Christians say is true. And of course, it's not because we say it, is it? It's because it's God's word. Born to be caught and destroyed was a common ancient saying about animals. Now, Peter isn't saying these people have lost the image of God. That's why they're blots and blemishes. They, they are image bearers, but they're blots and blemishes on that image. He's not saying they're animals. He says they're going to, be, they're going to have the same fate as animals. Animals in the first century were only good for two things, to be hunted and therefore killed by sport, or to be killed and eaten for nutrition. That was the only purposes of animals. Both purposes end in death. Peter is warning as seriously as he can, if you let yourself be trapped by reckless pride, the end is death and your poison that will cause death to others. I, I like National Geographic. I love the cameras. I love the colors. I love the, the way that they take me to places I could never go. And there was, there was this one episode on a puffer fish, also known as a blowfish. The, the, they have them in cartoons sometimes too. They can, and they puff up like three times their size. They're like a little goldfish, but they puff up like a basketball. And, of course, that's to protect them against predators. But what people don't realize is puffer fish or blowfish are also toxic. They, they have a chemical in them that's 1,200 times the poison of cyanide. So fish that bite a piece of them will die, but they could kill 30 human beings with just the toxin in one puffer blowfish, puffer fish. And there's no known antidote. Peter's saying that when we're puffed up with pride, we are toxic. Toxic to those around us. Toxic to the church. Toxic in our homes. Peter says, be on your guard against every form of pride. And by the way, you can not look at your watches because there's no way I'm done by noon. Okay? <laughs> And hey, we're not eating anyway. <laughs> so let's just go to two o'clock, right? <laughs> Secondly, be on guard against every form of license. I promise I'll be quick here. Be on guard against every form of license. Look at verse 13. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. Uh, that pleasure is where we get the word hedonism. Okay, this, this reckless pursuit of pleasure regardless of of whether or not God's word stands against it. That word revel means to live luxuriously. So he says, error in a Christian's life or error that a Christian needs to watch out for and error in the church, it might not even be true Christians, is luxurious living. Now, that is not a slam against um, enjoying the fruits of life and labor from time to time. Notice it says, their pleasure is to revel in the daytime. In other words, when people should be faithfully at work in their vocation or at work about mission, all they're consumed about is luxurious living, luxurious food, luxurious drink, luxurious entertainment, luxurious recreation. They're consumed with sensuality, feeding the five senses. So this is sensual license. Matter of fact, Jude again, if you want to understand 2 Peter, read Jude. Jude 4, these people pervert the grace of God into sensuality. In other words, we're talking about overindulgence. And boy, do we live in an overindulgent culture? 
And, and, and do we actually think that we wouldn't be affected by living in an overindulgent culture? It says there are blots and blemishes on your feast. You know, the first century church, they had communion every Sunday, and they used real wine. And then after communion, they would have a dinner. So this happened every week. And these licentious people who thought grace was an excuse to sin, they would get drunk on the wine at the dinner. And they would turn it into chaos, revelry, partying. And Peter says they're a blot on your feast, your love feast. Look at verse 14. They have eyes full of adultery, sexual license. Folks, this, look, I'm sorry if some of you moms get uncomfortable here, but this is God's Word, and if it's a little too R-rated for Sunday morning, then I don't know what I can tell you. How are we going to teach? How, if we don't talk about it here, where can we talk about it? Sexual license is perhaps the issue of our day when it comes to the church. Look, marriage is between a man and a woman who live together on the earth for all their days. And that is the only place for intimate relations. It doesn't any clearer than that. And yet that is being attacked on every side. The day is coming when I could be put in jail for what I just said. Now listen, I'm not saying that people who live in sexual sin are worse than me. I'm not saying they're worse than you. I'm saying sin is sin. Anger is sin. Unrepentant anger is becoming hardened in sin. Unrepentant anger, unrepentant impatience, unrepentant lust, unrepentant living in a relationship that is sexual that's not your spouse is sin, okay? Homosexual practicing relationships are sinful. Somebody that's same-sex attracted, that is not sinful. They're just broken the way you're broken. They're just broken differently. But the line is crossed when we say that practicing an immoral lifestyle is okay or embracing our brokenness in the sense that says I'm not repenting over it. That's also license. I know this is hard stuff, but this is so important that we understand. So then Peter gives the, the illustration of Balaam. Now, you may not know Numbers 22 to 24, but Balaam was a pagan prophet. In other words, he was a fortune teller, right? We, we got all these places that you drive by, don't mess with them. They're not curious things. They're truly evil. Now, of course, they would say, what do you mean? I'm just a normal person. This is just what I do. No. It's evil. And the devil is involved in it. So Balaam was a, was a fortune teller. And there was this king named Balak who was the king of Moab. And Balak, the king of Moab, noticed that the Israelites, through God's power, were destroying all the nations around Moab. And so Moab takes all this money and all this influence, and he, he drives by Balaam's fortune-telling booth. And he says, I'll give you a bunch of money if you use whatever fortune-telling powers you have to curse the future of Israel. And he's about to do it. But God shows up and says, Balaam, you may not do that. Balaam says, okay, I can't do that. King says, I got a lot of money. So the king comes back a second time. I got more money. I got more prestige to offer you. Balaam says, I can't say anything unless God's told me to, but tell you what, let me go ask him again. Folks, have you done that? Look, if God's word is clear, you don't need to pray about it. If God's word says, do this and don't do that, or don't do that and do this, you don't need to pray about it. 
You don't need to do further study on it. It's done. Now, are there some areas that God's Word doesn't address? Well, of course. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what the historic Orthodox Church has taught as black and white because it's clearly black and white in Scripture unless you try to twist it. So, dear people of God, don't fall into the licentiousness of our culture. It's attacking this word. It's reinterpreting it. It's reevaluating it. Just the way Balaam did. He wanted to reevaluate God's word. So he goes to God a second time. God says, okay, I'll tell you what. I'll let you go with him, but you better not say anything I haven't told you to say. So clearly on the way, Balaam is, is messing around with license in his heart. Because Balaam had a donkey... And the donkey just suddenly, there was plenty of room. Here's a cliff, plenty of room on the path. The donkey brushes up against the side of the cliff on the path and crushes Balaam's leg. Balaam gets a stick and just beats the fool out of the donkey. Donkey starts going. Donkey is a bit longer, a little bit farther along to the king of Balak. And he lays down. And Balaam just starts beating the pulp out of the donkey. And all of a sudden the donkey says, Yo! Hey! Do I always do this? Am I in the habit of crushing your leg against a wall? Am I in the habit of laying down under you? Now, Balaam's not even thinking while my donkey's talking. (laughs) Balaam's like reasoning. Well, no, I guess you don't normally do that. That's sort of weird. And then God opens Balaam's eyes and he sees the angel of death. God sent an angel to kill Balaam because he was about to slip into license. He, he was about to take the money and run. He was about to compromise God's word because it might give him prestige and power and control and riches and luxury. Do you see the relevance? How are we tempted toward license and compromise? Look at verse 16. A speechless donkey restrained the prophet's madness. People, living in license is insanity. Grace never allows for licentious beliefs. Grace never says it doesn't matter how you live. The whole point of grace is that you need it because of how you've lived. And you need it because of how God's called you to live. Grace never is an excuse for license. And license is craziness. And it will lead to death. And thirdly, finally, and I again, I promise quickly, be on guard against every form of delusion. Look at verse 13. They are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions. They're delusional. Listen, that's the problem with us as broken, fallen human beings. We have an incredible capacity to be delusional. This is why it's so critical to live in fellowship. Matter of fact, I promise you, if you're not living in regular fellowship with the body of Christ... You are delusional at some point. I don't know how, but I promise you, you are. Apart from the body of Christ, you will be deceived. Look, my friend always says this. Hey, Bob. This is how he talks. If you were deceived, would you know it? Think about that. If you were deceived, would you know it? Of course not. That's the whole definition of being deceived. Of course you don't know when you're deceived. That's why you're deceived. See, we have a capacity to be delusional, to fool ourselves about life, to fool ourselves about what's going on in our culture, to fool ourselves about God. And he says these people are are blots and blemishes reveling in their deceptions. They actually don't care if they're deceived. How about you? Do you really want to know the truth? Or do you want to be deluded? If you're deluded, what are you? Look at verse 17. You're a waterless spring. Can you imagine the frustration of being in the desert? You're really thirsty. You see a well. You sprint after it. You bring up the bucket, and it's full of sand. 
Look, you thought you were thirsty. Have you ever noticed when you're thirsty and then there's no water when you thought there was? You're suddenly 10 times thirstier than what you thought you were. That's what's going to happen if, if we don't live in God's word, if we don't live in the spirit, if we don't live in the community of the church. We're going to think that we're looking for refreshment in other places, and we're going to end up 10 times as thirsty. Mist driven by a storm. I just got back from a meeting in Montana, and I learned there's such a thing as dry thunderstorms. Did you know that? that in, in June, July, August, part of September, sometimes it never rains in northwest Montana during those months. And they have these things called dry thunderstorms. So the thunderheads are there, and way up at 60,000 feet, there's all kinds of lightning and rain and snow. But by the time it comes to the ground, it's dry. But here's the problem. There's no rain, but there is lightning. And the biggest cause of forest fires in northwest Montana is dry thunderstorms. That's what Peter's talking about. Mistless storms. Mists driven by a storm. Lives longing for refreshment end up being burned because of our delusions. Verse 17, for then the gloom of utter darkness has been, re re has been reserved. These people are deluded into thinking they're safe when they're in danger. And this is the last thing I'm going to say. This is my fear for Birmingham. People who think they're safe because they grew up in the church and they went to Christian schools and they're deluded. Peter says it would be better if those people never heard about Jesus. You, you do realize, that like in Dante's Inferno, which goes a little bit too far, there, there's these levels of suffering in hell. Well, Jesus did say that. Jesus said it would be better for Sodom and Gomorrah than for Capernaum. Because if Sodom and Gomorrah saw the signs and miracles of Jesus that he was performing in Capernaum, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented a lot sooner. And it would be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than Capernaum. It would be better if some people never walked an aisle, never prayed the sinner's prayer, never threw a stick on the fire, never joined the church, never said, I'm a Christian, never got baptized, than having professed all those things never knew Christ and walked away. Peter couldn't be more clear. These people were never saved. When it says they, they knew about the knowledge of Christ, it doesn't mean they actually were saved and lost their salvation. It means you will know them by their fruits. And we have way too many people in our city that I love who think because they've walked an aisle, prayed a prayer, joined the church, been baptized, that they are safe and they are deluded. People are growing up in a Christian home, growing up having Christian conversations, and they think they're safe. And they're deluded. Look, Laura and I have dogs, a bunch of them. And I promise you, verse 22 is true. <laughs> you got to tackle a dog to keep it from its own vomit. I know that's rough before lunch, but we're not eating, right? <laughs> a dog returns to its own vomit, meaning that a dog's a dog. A sow always rolls in the mud even after it's been washed because a pig is a pig. Now, Peter's not saying these people are dogs and pigs. He's saying you do what you do ultimately because of your nature. And if people have prayed the prayer but not really been saved, their nature of not being saved is going to be revealed. And he's warning all of us, don't be deluded. There's a radio show called Paul Harvey. Many of us who are older remember it. But he would always do this interesting story and say, now for the rest of the story. Do you know how Eskimos used to kill a wild wolf that was destroying their herds and flocks? They would get a two-edged knife, and they would coat it in blood. They would let it freeze 
and coat it in more blood. Let it freeze, coat it in more blood. Let it freeze, coat it in more blood. It became like a, this is gross, but a blood popsicle. And they'd stuck it, stick it in the ground, blade up, and they'd pack a little bit of snow around it. And the wolf, who's got an incredible sense of smell, would smell the blood. A creature of instinct, smelling the blood. And they go after it. And they lick this blood popsicle. And it's round and smooth, and it tastes wonderful. And the blood begins to melt. And the wolf is so deluded, it doesn't notice when the blood on the popsicle starts becoming its own blood because the knife is cutting its tongue to shreds. And it is so deluded, it keeps on eating and eating and eating, and it dies by eating its own blood. It bleeds to death. And the next day, there is one deluded, dead wolf. I love y'all. And maybe you think I've been harsh today. But I love you so much, I do not want you to be deluded dead people. And if I break a few ribs in the process, so be it. Let's pray. Father, help us. Help us. Help us say no to pride, no to license. Help us to understand as we live in community where we're deluded, where we're delusional, where we're just plain wrong about really basic things. God, make us a people of your word. God, bring us renewal and revival. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.